designed to encourage, empower, and educate real estate professionals by sharing best practices from business leaders that are proven winners. I'm your host, Kyle Malnati, and this is Calibrate Real Estate. Broadcasting from the Mile High City, thank you for tuning in to the Calibrate Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Malnati, and as you know, if you're an avid listener on iTunes or a watcher on YouTube, we are here, we're designed to encourage, empower, and educate real estate professionals. My esteemed guest today is a good friend, Amy Campbell. Amy Campbell comes to us from right here in my hometown, Denver, Colorado, but she didn't always live here. She moved here just about a year ago. She's coming up on that year anniversary of moving here with her husband, Dan, who took a job in software sales, and they have two fur babies. Those are dogs, for those that have not heard of what a fur baby is, and those dogs' names are Dory and Tula. Amy, welcome to our podcast. Thank you, Kyle. This is actually the first time I've ever recorded a podcast. Awesome. Well, you're doing great so far. (laughs) So we are so excited to talk about our content for today, which is how to plan a successful event. We actually have 14 points for people who have never planned an event before that we're going to run through. Amy was our MC for this amazing mastermind that we did a few months ago here in Denver, Colorado. Being an MC was a huge, I think, honor for you, but then also a big responsibility. Yeah. Every honor is going to end up having some responsibility attached to it. So I'd love to just first talk about like what the heck went through your mind as you're preparing to sure. be the MC from kind of the time that I meant, uh, mentioned to you like, hey, I'd really like you to do this to actually getting there day of and just kind of what are some of the things you did mentally to prepare yourself? Well, I still remember the day you called me and out of the blue and asked me to do it. And the first emotion, I guess, was kind of like fear. Like, I can't do that. That's outside of my comfort zone a little bit. And then the more I thought about it, I remember saying yes right away. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to commit. Why not do something out of your comfort zone? That's how you get better at things. And the more I talked to you about it and thought about it. It's like, you know what? I've done this in some capacity uh, with a, an office that I managed uh, and just presenting you know, every week in front of those agents and, um, and leaders. And so I so, said, you know what? Why not? This is something I can totally do. So um, I'm very excited and happy that I actually did it. So um, preparing, really my job was, it was twofold. It was to introduce all the speakers and then also time manage the event, which I think was the harder aspect of it and really keep it moving. So most speakers, especially since we didn't, excuse me, have a timer right in front of them, they didn't know how much time they had and a lot of them just get up there and like to talk and talk and talk. So I'm managing that and knowing when to stop a speaker is a fine balance of is the audience into it? Should I let them go over their time? Because it's something the audience really wants to hear versus, okay, we got to keep the event moving because we're running behind schedule. So, and we can talk through some of those challenges, but those were definitely the two, like the two responsibilities of the MCs to introduce the day, the event, and then keep it running and on time. Yeah. My reflection on that is you're really responsible for every guest's experience, even though you're not sitting there, you know, kneecap to kneecap with them saying, hey, you having a good time from the stage, you're basically directing traffic, both of speakers, but then also making sure that people have key takeaways from the mm-hmm. event. And so being an MC is, is, a, is a very, I'm, I'm glad that you said yes, because I felt like it was something that you were going to be able to shine and really show that your leadership experience with Keller Williams in Milwaukee, um, I think really trained you for that, even though you may have not literally done it for an event like this. So I think you did a great job. And Thank you. It's, that, it's that managing humans and making sure that people know you know, where the restrooms are and you're doing all this from stage, but you know, where the food is, Hey guys, it's time to have a quick break or when things kind of fall apart, which we'll talk about and you try to do everything you can, where it feels like you're turning the knobs and the, and, and getting everything done without people feeling like the event is not going the way that it's supposed to, but things just kind of, they get a little off kilter at times. Mm-hmm. And so being able to handle that with grace is a real skill. Well, thank you. It was definitely exhausting because your brain is constantly (laughs) engaged, right? And you listen and take notes, I discovered, in a different way than Mm. if you're just 
a passive participant. And um, I actually had a couple of comments from people afterwards when I would get up and, and give my takeaways that I voiced things that they maybe didn't pick up on or they, they did pick up on but didn't write down. And then once I said it, they're like, oh, yes, like that's exactly what I wanted to remember or that's such a good point and I didn't write that down. And so I, I didn't think about that part ahead of time. And that's a huge value and piece of the MC that they can bring to an event is the recap right? Because during someone's presentation, or sometimes I, I was looking back at my notes, one of the presenters I didn't take many notes on is because I was so engrossed in, in the story. And that happens a lot. But when you're the MC, it forces you to really pull the, the big ahas out and write them down so you can share them and kind of wrap it up for the whole group. It's really, it's a, it's a big deal because I think what ends up happening is your level of focus shows people that it's, it's something that they should be listening to and absorbing. And whether you pick something that maybe someone didn't think about, but they absolutely attach to it once you said it, or throughout the event as you're showing, these are my takeaways, people are saying, oh, okay, like it's not time to tune out. Amy, the MC, is sharing everything. Like she's an active learner with us, even though she's on stage. And it, I think it makes you relatable. It's, uh, I think it's a great opportunity to connect the audience with the speakers and make sure that everybody feels like they're being kind of heard or paid attention to. Because sometimes from the stage, as I've done different speeches, that's the hardest thing is, is really connecting with the audience. And if you have a great speaker, they do an amazing job connecting. And when we see those speakers that are not so strong, it's not because they're stumbling through their content. It's because it's frankly boring and they're not engaging the audience. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that that really links everything together if you can give those takeaways. And, Definitely. And communicate from the perspective, have that empathy, that, that perspective of the person that's sitting in the audience. Yes. Well, one reason it, may, it was so exhausting is you have that piece and you have the housekeeping piece of are we on time? When is lunch? Are all these logistics lining up? And so to have that piece of your brain totally engaged. And, and I remember at one point, the energy of the room seemed low. I think you came over to me and was like, let's ask everyone to get up and you know take a break and go outside. Yeah. So all of those little pieces, um, really keeping a temperature on the room as far as the energy, along with the note taking and being the student to share. It's like, I didn't realize how exhausted I would be after. Yeah. But it was, I had so much fun. Good. I well, definitely want to do it again. you did a great job. And I think we will be doing this more often going forward on a regular basis. It's great content for the podcast, but it's also just a, an awesome opportunity to bring really intelligent people into a room to mastermind, to share mm -hmm. ideas. And um, that's worthwhile. It really makes me excited to do things like that. Yeah. Um, so talking about logistics was something that you just mentioned. Let's go through some of the event planning because um, mm -hmm. those that are kind of subscribers to the DISC personality profile, this will make sense to you. Um, and if you're not a subscriber to the DISC personality profile, there's several other assessments that this will kind of relate to. So I'm a high I, high S. So I'm constantly wanting to make sure my S tendency is wanting to make sure that everybody is having a good time. Everybody's along for the ride and there's no like criticism, right? That's kind of some of the things that I think about. smooth and stable and That's not right. changing. Yep. And then the high I part of it is I'm a natural entertainer and I enjoy um, entertaining events. I like lots of action. I'm pretty wide open and enthusiastic. And so for me, the high C, which I don't have, is really that planning, uh, that, that planning ability. And so Kayla Davis, our business manager and the producer of this podcast, really steps into that role because she's a very, very organized planner. And so she put the, this agenda together. She also put together our after action review on how the event went so that we can have a nice executive summary for events in the, in the future. So we're gonna run through this. And I promise it's 14 points. We're not gonna bog you down. We'll summarize things. And you know, so the first thing that we had to figure out was we had to establish the date of the event. Um, we were figuring that a weekday for business people was gonna be two things. It would be more cost effective just because event space tends to be booked up for weddings and reunions and, and you know, just other types of social events. We figured during the day, a lot of event space would be available. And we opted to not do it at a hotel. We opted to do it at an art gallery because I have found that hotels can be kind of expensive when it, when it comes to things like this. Yeah, they're um, expensive and most hotels, they're dark, there's not inspired, they're kind of sleepy. 
Like it, if you ever experience right. that when you go to an event at a hotel, you're just, it's just kind of, it's a different feeling than if you're at a, a cool, you know, space with windows and just something that's out of the ordinary and unusual. Yeah, you're right. Usually the ballroom that you're in is an interior room that's kind of shut off to the actual exterior windows of the hotel. So you feel like you're, no matter how big it is, you feel like you're kind of in this, in this box, if you will, without... And then you get hypnotized by the horrible carpet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so we established a date for the event, and we established this date months in advance. I think that we picked our date, it would have had to have been October or, or November for an event in April. Mm -hmm. um, and we did that using a lot of feedback for, from some key personnel. Rob Reuter uh, at NAR was one of the big people that we said we didn't want the event to conflict with any national events yep. that NAR was doing. So that was a big deal. And then the other part of it too is just how long to have the event. So as the MC, you're really making sure that everybody, the trains run on time and that the event goes smoothly. So we had the event start at nine and end at four. Um, I'll let you take this away on how you feel like the event really went and what timing we should have done um, instead of maybe nine to four. I don't know if there's, a, if there's an exact right or wrong answer on the time of day um, or length. It, I think it's dependent on the actual event itself and the content. Um, <clears throat> but some ideas to consider if planning an event is or are, um, do you want it to be multi-day? And I know for this particular event, we, and we've kind of followed this, we've done this event in the past in different cities. You and I haven't planned it, but um, other 30 under 30 honorees have planned it. And so we've kind of just followed the, a similar structure um, for the past several years. But we do a, a happy hour the night before that involves um, food and drink and just networking and getting to know each other and catching up with people that we know but maybe haven't seen in a long time. And then we do a full day of kind of mastermind and learning from nine to four. And there's some mixed reviews on that full day because it is exhausting. It's exhausting for the people planning it. Um, I know for, for the MC, but it's also exhausting to be in the audience. It's so much information and so much good information that your brain is engaged all day long and come four o'clock, you are just done. And I know you can see, and I think that's what I mentioned before, the energy in the room after like 2 or 3 p.m. just really declines. And I think people hit the, their limit of how much information they can actually retain. So if the structure of the, year, the event you're planning is heavy on the content and information given, it might be best to plan a shorter day. Mm -hmm. If it's um, if you're incorporating more of a networking and or kind of group discussion aspect that I think you can probably make it a little bit longer um, or you know, kind of split it up. So to sit in a room and, and listen to speaker after speaker after speaker, I mean, again, ton of great information is learned, but it's also exhausting. And that was one of the feedback pieces that we received was people wish they had more time to socialize and to uh, talk to each other about ideas and what they were learning and just, hey, I'm doing this, or I'm thinking about doing this. I know you've done something similar. What are your thoughts and ideas? Because a lot of people plan their flights to kind of come in and, and leave pretty quickly before and after the event. So that doesn't always leave a lot of time for those discussions afterwards. So I would consider, and again, depending on the structure of the event and what you want it to, to look like, there's different timing options, but to do a full day like we did this year of just sit, people sitting in their chair all day listening, that's hard. Yeah, you bring up a good point that oftentimes with events, especially if they're recurring year after year, you get repeat attendees that are coming there not only just for the content, but also to network with each other. And um, this, this was event number four. It started in Chicago in 2015, then we did DC in 2016, Boston last year in 2017, and then Denver this year in 2018. And um, next year, we're looking at South Carolina, uh, which is going to be really a lot of fun. Official? That's, I mean, I talked to Brad, and it sounds like it's official. So it's official in that he wants to do it. Um, and uh, Brad Allen, I know yeah. you're listening. This is a call out. Make sure you get your, your act in order or just listen to this and you'll have all that you need to know. <laughs> um, but what ends up happening is when you take 
these event volunteers that are doing it really because they, they love the content and, you know, yes, there may be revenue left over at the end of the event, but sometimes there have been some events where the event planner was actually in the hole, but they're doing it because it's a reunion aspect. What ends up happening is you want to connect with everybody there. And if you jam pack your schedule, which I think we did, we, we agreed, I think at the end that we probably should have had maybe one to two less speakers um, which would have given people a little bit more time on stage, but then also it wouldn't have felt like we were constantly changing from speaker to speaker yeah. to speaker. Um, that would give other people time to connect with each other, get a breath of fresh air. If you're the introvert in the room, which I am not, but you've said that, that you are, it gives you a chance to just kind of like decompress for yeah. a second. Um, so yeah, that's the timing of the event I think is critical. And uh, let's just talk about the happy hour. The happy hour sometimes leaves people pretty foggy in the morning, uh, <laughs> which, which we have found. Now, I was, I was on my best behavior mostly because I am planning the event and I wanted to make sure, and my, I was losing my voice like crazy anyways from coaching lacrosse the weekend before, but I really wanted to be uh, alert and I had a lot of stuff I had to do in that morning. But, uh, but yeah, the, the happy hour, I think, uh, is, is one of the best opportunities for people to connect but it leaves them feeling a little bit groggy in the morning. <laughs> yeah, but especially with this group, we're, most of us, I think, are still under the age of 40. Yeah. And some of them are, are under the age of 30. So um, it's a, a younger group that um, a lot of them are in, in the stage of their life where they have young kids, so maybe they don't get to go out a lot. Right. And so some people do get a little crazy, but that's part of the fun, right? That's part of the fun of the – of the event. Um, we did have a, a couple people straggling a little late the next day, but you know, also it's the nature of realtors. You know, a lot of people don't like to get up early in the morning and, and be somewhere by 8 a.m. Um, getting back to our list, uh, item number one is establish the date of the event and also the timing of the event. We've talked about the venue several times. Establishing that is going to be a couple of different things. You've got to have the money set aside. So I was willing to put money in advance because I knew we were going to be t selling tickets for the, uh, for the deposit, but you do typically expect that you're going to have to put down a deposit. In this case, it was half of the total event venue cost. And so that could be a lot of money if you're, if you're looking at a high-end space. Um, we did this six to seven months out of the event because we felt like if we were going to announce the event date, the event time, we'd also need to you know, do that who, what, where, when, why. So the, the, the where is really important. So people could logistically figure out where they were going to stay at hotels so that they could get reasonably close to the event venue. Yep. And you talked about the event venue being a nice, open, bright, um, fun atmosphere. And for our event, that was appropriate. So I think that, I think that that was a really good setup. A um, couple of things to think about when you're thinking about an event is how are you going to do AV? You know, the AV, I think, for an event to be really good has got to be on point. To have good speakers, both your lav mics as well as your handheld mics. I feel like we had a great AV company. They did a very good job. Yes. And a then couple we, things that we talked about maybe we would want to add, um, given the budget. But I think we had talked about, um, when, and I referenced this in the beginning of our conversation, is a secondary screen for the speakers on stage. It has a clock. So they can easily see what their timing is. And that helps the event as a whole, as well as a speaker and kind of organize and work through their speech. Yeah, I saw this on one of the local news stations as they were doing some, we have a big governor race happening here in Colorado this year. And so four of the candidates were being interviewed by one of our news anchors here in Denver. And they had these big red screens that would count down from 60 seconds all the way down and you could not miss it. You'd mm -hmm. see it as they were in the studio and it would have been so nice to have that, you know, and our church does this too, yep. this big, you know, this big event clock so that people can know exactly There's how they're on time. In the back of the room with the yeah. little piece of paper, like one minute. <laughs> and then if they weren't looking, if the speaker wasn't looking in my direction, then they didn't catch it. So I was holding up a one minute sign for like five minutes. I'm like, okay, this defeats the purpose. Right. Maybe just throw it at them or, yeah. or they were trying to avoid you seeing something. That I, that's, I definitely learned that as the MC. You need something to get the attention of the speakers when they're, you know, a five minute warning, a one minute warning and time's up. 
Yep. So step number three, after you've got your date and time established for the event, that's step one. Step two, the venue and some of the logistics around that, um, which is seating and AV and all this other stuff. You talk with your event company um, that's, that's hosting the event at that location. Number three is we did a Facebook page. And mm -hmm. I think it doesn't have to be a Facebook page, but you do have to figure out how you're going to disseminate information. And I have found that email is very one-sided and um, oftentimes can get blocked if you're putting too many people on it. So we just popped out. We've got a Facebook page for our alumni group anyways, but then we did a separate event group page and it worked really well just to share some information. And then we would do some more formal announcements by email. Um, I would send text messages to speakers and different things, but um, actually communicating with your event attendees and creating community yes. with your communication, I think is really important as people are excited about going, but then also sharing content yep. during the event. And then afterwards, like talking about different things. I think things. it's key. Like you said, it's emails very one-sided, a lot of communication, you know, even the invite that we send, people can't communicate back and forth. And it takes pressure off of the event planners if you have a way for the attendees to communicate with each other, because now all of a sudden they're asking each other questions versus contacting the planner to say, what hotel is everyone staying at? You know, where should I be and when? Or whatever the question is, they all of a sudden can ask the community of people that are attending and someone else can answer versus the planner. Yeah. Being the only source of information. It doesn't put that burden yeah. on that person because that is the hardest thing is you're getting questions all over the place. Some people will, because they've got my personal cell phone, they'll text me or call me. Um, but you've got a lot of people that are interacting on social media that just want information. And our whole planning committee has the ability to communicate instead of just one of us. I, I completely yep. agree with you. So that we're, we're great segue. We're talking about now the people that you're going to plan the event with. It wasn't just you and it wasn't just me. I already mentioned the uh, formidable Kayla Davis yes. who did it. Kayla deserves all the credit. She's <laughs> amazing. And like Kyle mentioned and or like you mentioned in the beginning of um, our conversation, the disc profile. If you don't know your disc profile, take, take it. I think it's free in TonyRobbins.com. Um, if you're not a high C and you're not detail oriented, find someone that is to help you plan the event. Because Kayla's very high C, correct? Yes, and huge high C, a very high C than high S. So we kind of share that mm -hmm. S tendency. So do you. Yeah. So we're all wanting to make sure everybody has a good time and no one's left behind. Yep. But the high C is, we call her within our office and this is totally appropriate. We call her the executioner because she just executes on things and I'll set the vision and then she just knocks stuff yeah. down. It's, and it's she great. thinks of things and she thought of things for this event that you and I hadn't talked about or the group that we put together hadn't talked about. There's so many little details that go into planning an event and a lot of them by nature of event planning end up, uh, a lot of decisions end up being they're kind of clustered if you ever planned a wedding. They're kind of clustered together with, you, know, you do a lot of things six months out and then three months out and then like a million things a week of, right? And if you're not that detail-oriented person, it's going to be tough. Right. And Kayla, it's funny, I was giving her a hard time as she was on the beginning of this video feed that we do on Zoom as we were just kind of working through some audio and some technical stuff. Um, I gave her, I was joking with her and I said, you know, you're going to be, surprise, surprise, you're going to be on this podcast. And she shakes her head. No, no way. Because for the high C personality, a lot of times they're not looking to be the star on stage. Right. And so it takes everybody. It takes mm -hmm. different personality types to make an event. I right. typically am part of the welcoming committee. I'm driving out to DIA. I'm yep. saying hi to people. I'm chattering a million miles a minute. Um, but the person who's planning the event is not going to be the person who's sitting, work in the room, shaking hands. They're like in the trenches making stuff happen. Mm -hmm. And putting out fires. Yeah. So if you don't have a Kayla Davis, she's not for hire. She works for our organization. <laughs> don't but, coach. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But what I can say is there's tons of great event planners. Mm -hmm. And um, I think about this like I think about uh, our recent uh, renovation that my wife and I did on our house. We hired a designer. The designer pulled everything together. You obviously need a GC. You need an architect, a structural engineer. You need all the subcontractors that work for the GC. But if everything's builder grade, the house will get built. It looks awesome, you know, from a from a stature, mm -hmm. structural standpoint. 
But all of those little design elements are really important. And so that person that's got that detail orientation, that's a really big thing for an event. And so yep. hiring an event planner could be something that you might need to do if you're not that high C and you don't have mm -hmm. someone on your team. But let's talk about some of our other teammates. So Amy, you were the MC. That was something I tapped your shoulder and said, let's do that. I was kind of the event host. It wasn't just me, but people looked at me kind of as the focal point. You were, you as were the host. our host, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Kayla was uh, very much kind of the right hand of making things happen, but we also had some other big personalities that were involved. Amanda devito Parle, uh mm -hmm. did several uh, things for the event. She rallied a bunch of interest. Um, she is one of the kind of OG 30 under 30. She's one of the originals. She's heavily involved in YPN. She's a mom which makes her very organized. Um, but she also did several events uh, or several things at the event on stage, yes. which I think is really important. And it's important to mention her by name. So let's talk about Amanda for a little bit, just on sure. kind of her personality profile. She's a high D, mm -hmm. high I. I she, yep. she likes to describe herself as a, as a lion that roars. And so yeah. she'll get people, you know, right, right. Uh, she'll get people right in line. And I think you need that person too yes. that's gonna to be that demonstrative personality. She's a big personality. She tells it like it is. Um, she's lots of fun. And so it's fun to see her on stage, but she was part of the planning process and she was integral, integral in, in getting um, interest and helping us get speakers, right? Mm -hmm. to, to fill out the content as well as uh, moderating a panel. We did a working moms panel and she moderated that for us. And then she stepped into a role that we need a last minute. We yeah. need it filled um, because her schedule changed slightly and she was able to step in and do one of the interviews on stage as well. So let's talk about that. We had a situation where one of our, um, one of our guests needed to be interviewed instead of doing a keynote presentation. There was just some logistical things that happened. And I, I had suggested this at the beginning. And so they said, Hey, you thought about this on the front end. I originally wanted to do a speech. I can't do it. Uh, let's just have kind of a fireside chat type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, great. All of a sudden I looked at it though and I was gonna have three interviews in addition to my own keynote speech. And I was kind of talking to a lot of people, you included, where I'm like, I just feels like this is gonna be a lot about me and I don't want the event to be that way. And so we asked Amanda if she could step in on an interview that she really hadn't done before and she didn't plan and it wasn't her baby, but she did it flawlessly. Mm -hmm. She did a great job. Yep. And you've got to have those people that are willing to raise their hand and say, yes, I can, I can help you because this event, even though I might be the host and Kayla might be doing a lot of the work, if you're not involved, if a man is not involved, and then some of our more, um, you know, kind of quieter event um, hosts were Liz Moore mm -hmm. and Leslie Moen. Um, you know, they both did a good job of just creating some, um, for lack of a better term, some kind of uniformity to what we were doing. Uh, linking arms with us and saying, this is what the team is going to do. And they also would question a couple of different things and provide just that alternative perspective. They had great ideas on yes. the idea planning when we first met and we all got in a room together and was talking about what we want this event to be. Having more voices than, I mean, you don't want to get too, too many opinions, right? But having a good group of people with different personalities and different backgrounds really will help you plan a well-rounded event. So even though they might not have been on stage, they were very helpful in the planning stages. Yeah, and then one other thing that I wanna just mention that didn't really happen out in the front, but it's something that's very important for any event that I've been a part of that's been successful, is you typically have your past event chair kind of be this emeritus role within the event. So that was Eric Rollo mm -hmm. and Brad Allen. I had the fortune of working with them on the event in Boston last year. So you have this very intentional baton passing of last year's event and this year's event. And maybe they're not as involved this year as they were last year. Um, but I was involved from afar in the Boston event. Eric was there running the entire show. And so what that does is it creates continuity and you don't miss out on as many things as you would if you were doing this from right. scratch. Or you just don't make the same mistake twice. Yes. I mean, you do, just not as big. <laughs> well, and you improve the event every year. Right. I was a part of the event in 2015, which was hosted by NAR. Then I was a speaker in 2016. I was a speaker again in 2017, then host in 2018. Mm -hmm. So you get this continuity and you have some speakers like James Nellis, who has been at every one of the events. Yeah. And 
that creates, okay, we know what to expect. There's some consistency with the event. Exactly. So as you plan an event, your team, assembling your team, you need to, again, the takeaways here, pick different personality profiles that you know are going to work well together, but that are not the exact same. You know, if there's too many identical personalities, some of you are not necessary. You need people who are going to complement each other with different personality profiles and personality styles. And then it doesn't have to be everybody local, but it really helped us that we could all get together in a conference room every now and again. But we did a lot of this through Zoom. We did a lot of it on the phone, text messaging, things of that sort. Our next step was selling tickets. So mm -hmm. Eventbrite is step number five, creating the event, the e invite as well as the actual ticket sales. So we used Eventbrite. They did a great job. Uh, it was a great platform for both collecting money, but then also just having our actual event invitation be digitally online. I feel like Eventbrite, if you've not used it, is kind of a step above Evite. You know, it's kind of a similar platform, but you can, you know, pay for tickets online and they send you money and it's, it was right. a good warehouse for it. And this was mostly Kayla's department. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know all the details, but I do know, depending on the type of event and the number of attendees that you're expecting, um, Eventbrite charges a decent percentage, right? Yeah. So it was like 12 bucks a ticket right. out of a $200 ticket. So we'll talk more about the pricing of it, but yeah, it was a pretty healthy 12 or 13 bucks. Yeah. And so Eventbrite made, and they should make money, right? Cause mm -hmm. they're, they've created the platform for it. They made something like a thousand, maybe $1,300. Yeah. So the benefit of using Eventbrite is convenience, right? It's easy to create the, uh, the event, the invitation, um, and send it out. And then it's kind of an automated, automated system at that point. You send the link out and people can you know, buy tickets and then it alerts the event organizer and creates, you know, I think attendance spreadsheets and different information for you. The downfall is you're paying for that service. So if your event is going to be smaller scale, it might be easier to use a service that maybe not, isn't as robust and doesn't provide as much um, assistance, but doesn't charge as much. That's a great point. So we were planning on having a hundred people at this yeah. event, uh, just attendees that doesn't have to uh, count in caterers and other people. So I mean, there's over a hundred people in a space like this. And we knew that that was possible based on the prior events. That was kind of our, you know, some events were less attended than others, but you know, 75, hundred people, we were figuring we need a platform that anyone can buy a ticket at mm -hmm. any time. And the fun thing that we had was we would get the notifications when someone bought a ticket and you'd have people buying tickets at 11.30 p.m. You know, like- We have time. Yeah, exactly. That's when someone is getting their to-dos yeah. done, right? Or someone buying it at five or six in the morning. You don't want to have to be the one picking up the phone right. or swiping a square or doing whatever, right. automating it. If you don't have an automated service like Eventbrite, logistically, if your events, you know, more than 30 people, you know, it's going to be a pain. I agree. Yeah. We could have collected checks or done Venmo or whatever, mm -hmm. but it just becomes real difficult. So, um, and then something that's really important is I allocated a completely separate bank account that really didn't have anything coming in and out except for event money and event expenses. And we'll talk about the budget around this in a little bit, but we chose a ticket price of $200. Now that might seem kind of expensive to some that might seem kind of kind of inexpensive to others, but $200 was our most popular ticket price. And I'm sharing that openly because I found that to be interesting. We had, we kind of did this, you know, must buy the ticket now, otherwise the price will increase. And, and we did that. Mm -hmm. Prices increased from 200 to 275. And then they ended up increasing at the very end of 350 in the last couple of weeks. And the whole point there is the more people you got signed up early, the easier it was to estimate things like a caterer and right. to pay, make sure to pay back the people who funded the deposit for the event space yeah. and make and sure. it fuels the interest. Yes. Right. If people don't want to be left out. So if there's, if it's known that a bunch of people are buying their tickets six months in advance, I'm like, well, if all those people are going, I'm going to go too. So I'll just buy my ticket now. Right. Um, so the tickets make sense to charge whatever you want to charge for them. Uh, but the thing that we did before that, and I don't want this to get lost on the subject, is you have to figure out who's going to go. Mm -hmm. So your event's got to have a theme. Um, it's going to have to have some slated keynote speakers, which we'll talk about if you're going to have a heavy content piece. But you really you have to premeditate who the attendee is going to be. So we're using the lens of real estate for our mm -hmm. event attendees, but you might be doing a local event that's just in Colorado or just in Wisconsin. 
And you're not going to be probably inviting someone from New York if that's the case. So try to figure out what the connectivity is between right. your event group, and then you can pick that pricing on, on your event tickets. Yep. Next item was we shared this event a lot. So you want you you got to be careful because you can kind of oversaturate mm -hmm. the communication. But we would send regular updates on how many tickets were sold. Like you said just a moment ago, creates awareness that people are signing up, they're opting in, and it creates demand because as more and more tickets get sold, we started to say, hey, look, our event venue is kind of capped at about 100 people. So if you want to go, you've got to get your tickets. Um, but we're sharing this on the regular, once every week, once every two weeks. As the event got closer, you're sharing it more and more. And you alluded to a wedding. A, a wedding is a great way to think about an event. You're bringing a lot of people into a space and you want to let people know probably nine months ahead of time, like, hey, save the date, we're getting married, or save the date, we're doing an event. And then it's going to be kind of quiet for a couple of, uh, couple of months. Six months is probably the next major benchmark where we're like, okay, we're really, this event's got to happen. And you're working around different holidays and different vacation schedules of the people planning it. And then you really start to get into crunch time three, four, and two months in, because then you've got to start paying a lot. You really right. start to see the event lift off the ground with yep. the attendees and all of that. Start finalizing. <clears throat> Something that I didn't mention earlier that I just remembered <clears throat> was, I don't know if this has to be coincidence, the last two years, so last year event, our event in Boston and then this year in Denver, ironically coincided with a large, I think they're both medical conventions. And, and we're talking 20 to 30,000 attendees at yeah. these conventions, at the convention center. And that put pressure on hotel availability and therefore hotel prices. And I think last year in Boston, I paid $500 a night for a room and people you know, stayed all over Denver um, in different areas. And some people got Airbnbs, mm -hmm. which is always a good option. Um, but when you're planning, when you're trying to figure out the date, look at if there's any big or major events going on in that city, because that can really affect availability, it affects flight prices, right? It affects mm -hmm. hotel prices and that can discourage someone from attending if it gets a little too expensive. Yeah. And we, one of the fast track shortcut ways to do that is we just called a couple of hotels that we mm -hmm. figured would be natural spots. We didn't have a host hotel, but we wanted to pick a cluster that a couple people could pick different options of branded hotels that would be, people might have points for them or just they'd be familiar if you're staying from out of town, you wanna stay at one of the bigger names probably. Um, if you're not looking for that kind of organic, unique experience that someone might get with an Airbnb. And upon two or three calls, they're like, hey, we're already really booked up because of this event or that event. And you go, oh, okay, well, we had to kind of keep our date because of NAR scheduling. Mm -hmm. And realtors, there's big conferences all year round that you just, you don't want to place it on that date. Um, but then the hotel is one of them. And then we ended up finding out that one of our really big um, hosts that has done this event for a couple of years, our, our friends at Keller Williams in Washington, DC, they had their own mastermind going on mm -hmm. that was a Keller Williams branded mastermind. And we missed out on several people. Now there were some that could attend, but then there were some key leaders Brandon Green and Bo Mankiti that have been very involved in this event that were just like, gosh, really sorry. Ginger Green. Oh yeah, Ginger, that's right. So there's several people that you just say, gosh, I'm sorry, I have a, I have a conflict. I just, I can't, I can't do it. Um, so that's, it's a bummer when that happens, but I think the flip side of it is you're never gonna be able to pick an event right. date that's gonna work for everybody. Right. So try to figure it out for the masses, be wise about how you do it, talk to the hotels, talk to the key personnel. If you're doing this within a trade organization like the, the Realtor brand is, try to talk about what national events you might be competing with because people are not gonna be able to go to an event every month and, and you're, you are competing for their time.